We'll give the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. With five seconds, he's going to throw it. Howard leaps. He has it. Touchdown. Carolina back from the dead to tie the game with two seconds to go. There is a flag down. But holy smokes. It's two and four in overtime games. Carolina one and three here from under center. Give off to Greg Little. Little pulls away. Little is going to score. Carolina wins. Snap back, spot down. The kick is cleanly away. It is good. And Big it's ah, with yes, a sir. 54 yard field goal. And how about them Tar Heels? They do it. Possible win. Snap. Spot. Kick away. High enough. Long enough. It's good. It's good. Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter In his end zone. One. Very high. Switzer will have room to return it. He feels it at the 40. Coming near side. Switzer at the 50. Switzer, 45, cuts back at the 40, 35, breaks a tackle at the 30, still on his feet. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Ryan Switzer for six. He is doing his best Giovanni Bernard impression. Ryan Switzer again. Bernard fields it at the 26, heading to the far side. What's going on, guys? It's the Heel Tough Blog Podcast on a Wednesday night and a day that I did not know uh, if many people thought we would be coming to you here. Uh, When we began the day, and that's because the Tar Heels, they did end up making a move and they end up letting go of two defensive coaches. But let's be honest, did we really all have confidence that Carolina was going to actually go through with it? We heard the reports. We saw them from inside Carolina before the bowl game. But I think, you know, everybody kind of just thought the same thing, that this was Mac Brown saying if things weren't satisfactory, that Carolina would then make a move. Well, clearly, even if, you know, this this was decided beforehand, like the reports say, if it was not, whatever, Mac Brown decides that he needs to make a move and makes two moves that I think we both probably agree with uh, when it's all said and done at the end of the day. And it starts, of course, uh, it was right around about 11 o'clock this morning. The football program releases the official information, the report, uh, or uh, the, the statement, I should say, from them, uh, where they confirm that Carolina has mutually parted ways with Gene Chizik. That's kind of how we thought that would go if that move was made. Um, and they really didn't specify on what exactly happened with Tim Cross. It was kind of odd. They were just like, oh yeah, by the way, Ted Monachino is taking over for Tim Cross. Um, So that would lead me to believe that Tim Cross was probably let go. Um, But regardless, uh, these are moves that, I mean, look, Carolina had to do something. And if it wasn't going to be Mac Brown retiring, then he had to make a move to, 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 to give some sort of juice to this offense. Because look, I mean, there are elements of this team that you can be excited about. I, I still really like the fact, you know, what I saw from Connor Harrell. I think there's a chance he could be a really good player. But let's be real here. There's not much to be excited about with this program right now. This gives you a little something. It, I'm not saying this is going to be a surefire change to the program. Carolina is going to make it to the college football playoff. The next year or the year after. Not saying that, but it felt like they needed some sort of life in this program. And, I mean, look, not the most popular move with the players. I will say that 
Remember when Jay Bateman was fired? That wasn't an overly popular move with the players. Um, but a lot of the guys decided to stick around. There wasn't a mass exodus. This one, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't think that Gene is the one that mo most guys will be tied to. There will be some. There will be some in the recent classes that came in that probably fit his scheme and will say, okay, I don't really know about the new guy that's coming in if I'll fit what he's going to do. Um, I think the defensive line is probably the area that you look at and you say, what effect does this have on the current roster? Um, but to me, I, I don't think you can let that influence this move. If you felt like the, these were moves that had to be made to make your team better, I feel like they had to go through with it. And to me, at least, I think that these are two moves that do probably make you better in the long run. Yeah, I mean, on the surface, um, you know, I said, if you want to keep Gene, that's fine. But let him make decisions about the coaching staff on that side of the ball. Mm -hmm. I, I think this was more about Gene wanting to get out of coaching. I don't think he was fired. I don't think he realized, look, I, I did a lot of decent things while I was here. Didn't do what I wanted to do. Um, I want to go back and be with my family. <clears throat> totally understand that. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 Tim Cross move was necessary. Yes, because you too just late. Were, a year too late to be honest with you. You just weren't competitive on that side of the ball. Um, and look, he can be a great guy, and he can be great with the players off the field. This is a results-driven business. You were getting paid a lot of money to make the defensive line look better than what it did in your five years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the players being unhappy, it's another reminder that players today now commit to coaches more so than a program, which I think um, is a problem. But, you know, they've got to understand that this is how it works. This is how it's going to work at the next level uh, in, in the pros. Like – Coaches don't perform. Coaches get fired. So, um, you know, I'm not going to say I'm proud of Mac for doing this because you don't want to see somebody get fired. But we know this wasn't easy for him because he's such a loyal man. And the fact that he made those decisions lets you know deep down he is doing what he, think is, what, what he thinks is best for the program. I mean, look, it's back-to-back -back years he's had to make tough decisions. Last year, he had to let Dre Bly go. Um, this year, I mean, look, he's got a connection with Gene Chizik. He was on his staffs at Texas, so he's got a pretty strong relationship with him. And Tim Cross, I, I, I'm, I don't remember if Tim Cross was with him at Texas. I feel like there was some sort of connection. But even if not, like Tim Cross has been here five years. And, you know, one of the hardest things is that, yeah, the, the, these are guys getting – fired for, from their job, basically. I mean, yeah, I would do Gene, I, I think part of what you said is definitely correct. I think also it's it's one of those things where both sides probably agreed this is what's best. Um, but, I mean, with Tim Cross, like, I mean, Tim Cross did so much more. We, we heard about it last year in the offseason. Tim Cross does so much more for this team than just coach the D-line. Um, he's a great recruiter. But more, mo the most important role that he took over was the role that Mitch Mason had to leave behind when he got sick, which was team chaplain. And I think that was part of the reason why Mac Brown may have stuck with him for another year on top of the fact that, you know, he had such great relationships with the guys in the room. Because I think he, you know, he knew how much that relationship with the entire team probably meant. Um, you know, hopefully there is somebody that can step into that role and and and, and take it over. Um, but it's an important part. It's something that they need. We've seen how important that's been in the past. Um, so I get that, and that's that's where it really sucks. But this team needs a new voice in that room more more than anything. And I get it, man. The guys in that room, you you develop a bond, especially like I've seen it from from covering high school football. Um, you know, I haven't been lucky enough to be able to cover 
the Tar Heels close enough to to witness what it's like in some of those position rooms. But just from covering high school football, and even when I was in high school and was and was around the football team, the bonds that your offensive and defensive linemen have with their coaches is just different. Like, yeah, all your position coaches are very tight with you, but your offensive and defensive line coaches are incredibly tight with their players. It's just, it's the way it is. So for those guys, I know they're devastated, but the thing is, is that you look at the way you guys have been producing and look, man, I, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, he put it out on social media, not trying to throw him under the bus. I get it. It's an emotional moment. I, I understand being frustrated. And look, you have a right to feel the way that, that you want to feel and, and put it on social media, especially in the new uh, era of college athletics. But Travis Shaw, I mean, he, he wasn't happy. My thing to Travis Shaw would be, dude, you were a five-star coming out. You barely played, man. Like, don't you want to play? Don't you want someone that can develop you? Look at look at yourself and look around the rest of the room. Like, they haven't been developed. It's nothing personal against Tim Cross. It's just that it hasn't worked. You know, it, wor it worked early under Jay Bateman. You saw him take over a room with guys like Jason Strobridge and Aaron Crawford. And look, that year, he did a great job because those guys had to play as much as any defensive lineman in college football. And he still got the best out of those guys. But really, since then, I mean, the guys that he has brought in, he just has not been able to develop and make them live up to the standard that they set for themselves coming out of high school. And my thing is, is look, maybe some of it is the talent. There is no way that every single guy in that room wasn't good enough. That's there's it's it's impossible. It cannot be because you've recruited you know guys that Ohio State, Alabama, LSU, guys I, I mean they've been recruited by the best teams in the country. So it cannot be every guy. At some point it's got to be the coaching. To me that one there's no way that you can argue that. Gene Chizik, I, I think you're right. You could have made the case that he and I thought this when they hired him and they decided to keep everybody in place. I didn't understand why the all the assistants had to stick around. If he had assistants that fit what he wanted to do better, why was he not? I, I, I just don't get it. Why was he not allowed to hire his own guys? Like it just doesn't make sense. And Max should have known that. Like, I, I don't know if Gene just didn't didn't make it known at any point. But I, I, I mean that that was one that had me scratching my head, and that'll probably be one thing that Gene will look back on and, and be frustrated about. But in the end, I mean, to me, looking back last year, how long, I mean, they never seemed to pick up the system, and then this year, when things got tough, this group regressed back to what they were last year, and he did. You you look at his scheme. I thought. Because because tell me if I'm wrong on this. I thought his scheme was was much more aggressive in the first half of the year. When they had that game against Miami, which they still won, by the way. All of a sudden, you saw a change of we have to go back to being conservative. We're not as aggressive on the outside. We're not blitzing as much. It To me, he just he fell back into bad habits. And you cannot have a, a defensive coordinator that gets swayed that easily by a rough game. Nope, you can't, man. You know, I think that's going to be – I guess the challenge is to find the right guy to come here because, let's be honest, it's not a very attractive job just given the track record. Um, you're probably getting hired to get fired. But the first six weeks, I mean, Carolina was playing good enough on that side of the ball to get back to Charlotte. Like, you were there. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't complete the job. You didn't complete the mission. And I, you got to wonder where Mac Brown goes. Because his first hire, he got the young up-and-comer guy in Jay Bateman. And he just went like it wasn't it wasn't ready. He wasn't ready to go from group of five military academy yep. to power five. Now he's ironically at AM, a little bit older, a little bit more mature. 
maybe he um, – maybe now he is ready for that role. You go and get Gene Chizik, a guy that you have familiarity with, a guy that's done it here in the same kind of position where, you know, you're not asking them to be, you know, vintage Bama defensively, and it just didn't work out. And then so um, – you got to go and, and, and figure out who who the right guy for the job is. And you probably want to see Mac Brown go out of his comfort zone mm-hmm. and hire somebody that he probably doesn't have a relationship with, that he didn't meet while either coaching or while he was broadcasting. Because that's probably the type of hire you need to, to get the defense in the program back playing average on that side of the ball. Well, I mean, look, and, and I want I put it in the description of this episode uh, for, for the live video. I want to hear some of the names that you guys are interested in because I think I, I, I think there are names out there that are still available that you can go and get. I, I, I think you need someone that is younger. There are guys that are a little bit older that Mac Brown probably has relationships with, but you're right. You have to go out of your comfort zone with this hire. Um, I don't. I don't necessarily think it's it's you're hired to be fired if you hire the right guy. Like that's the thing is that there there are guys that you can go out and get, and you could feel pretty confident that they can be the future of, of, of this job for a while. I'm not saying that you're thinking that these guys are going to be Hall of Fame level guys, but I will say this. One thing that you have to be willing to do here, you're going to have to be willing to pay a little bit of money. Like, this can't be, oh, we're just trying to find the bargain deal. No, you've got to legitimately sit down and say, there are some big-name candidates out here. This is a problem that we have had for a while. We need to be willing to pay to actually go out and find somebody that is willing to take this job. And, I mean, look, I, I... I think just from looking at the list that I'm compiling together for the article that I'm going to put out of my top five, I really can't believe some of the names that are still out there. Like there have been some really, I I would say coveted, but there are some like at at this point, how coveted is the USC defensive coordinator job? Like there, there is so much pressure that comes with that job. This job. Yeah, there's pressure. But I mean, I think it, you know, you kind of showed it right there. Nobody really expects anybody to do anything in this job. So I think that there might be some people that would be willing to take on this challenge. Now, I mean, how how big of a, a, a risk you're you're willing to take? I mean, I don't know. There's there's some guys out there, I mean, that I, I think some Toriel fans would probably pass on. Just based on some of the all the, the well, I, I guess technically the one guy that I'm thinking of that has off the field stuff that's technically on the field is DJ Durkin, and he was the D coordinator at Texas A&M this year. Now the thing with him, he had a lot of talent around him um, there. It's still to me the fact that he was able to turn that group into as good of a unit as they were. I mean, they ranked inside of the top 30, I think, in just about every defensive category when, I mean, it was a dumpster fire there. Like, they knew from the word go, like, he Jimbo wasn't lasting. You were brought in, him and Bobby Petrino both knew, we're being brought in to pretty much be let go. Um, And I thought he still did a really good job, but, yeah, there's controversy with him. Um, I I think there are some other names, though, that are incredibly interesting that are some former coaches. Um, Zach Arnett would be a very obvious one from Mississippi State. Problem with him is, is he going to want to come coach at Carolina after getting a buyout from Mississippi State after not even coaching a full year there? Probably not. He's probably going to say, ah, I'll take a little bit of time off, and then I'll come back. Um, the one that really, really intrigues me is Jeff Collins because – he did a great job. That, that's how he got a head coaching job was by being a really good defensive coordinator at Mississippi State. He followed it up and was a good coordinator at Florida. So he's done it in the SEC with you know some some good talent. I mean, Mississippi State, he did it 
we're at a spot where you don't get a ton of talent. Florida, that's a little bit I, – I would kind of compare it somewhat to what Carolina is dealing with, where when he got there, a lot of the guys that were there, they really just weren't producing the way that they were supposed to, and he still got the most out of that unit before he, of course, moved on and eventually became the head coach at Temple and the head coach at Georgia Tech. The thing that I really like about him as well is I mentioned right there at the end, coached at Georgia Tech. He knows your recruiting fruit footprint. That's where he was recruiting. You're hitting the Georgia area really, really hard, especially that Atlanta area. That's where he was. So I think he would be a great hire. Mac Brown, I don't like clearly, probably not much of a relationship with him outside of a couple of handshakes, talking before games, but still young enough. I think that would be a great one. And then the other one that I have on there is Jim Leonard. Now, Jim Leonard, I mean, that would be one like the amount of money you'd probably have to offer him. Like he's going to want a pretty good amount of money. You'd have to shift the scheme as well. Same thing with Zach Arnett. Zach Arnett runs a 3-3-5. Uh, Jim Leonard is a 3-4 guy. Um, so you would have to shift the schemes around a little bit. But uh, to me, if Jim Leonard is even remotely interested, you tell him how how much do you want, uh, when can you get here, and how many years do you think you need before you can be the head coach? Because he, I mean, he he was one of the biggest up and coming names in the sport before Paul Chris departs. He takes over the interim job, and Wisconsin just basically spurns him and says, "Ah, we're going to go with Luke Fickle." Um, so. I, I mean, out of those list of names, I mean, does anyone really stick out to you? Like to me, I th like Jim Leonard would be my number one. That's probably similar to Ben Johnson when I brought him up. If Mac Brown was to leave, I really, really like the idea of Jeff Collins. I, I, I think that would be a really strong hire. Well, it's the most realistic. Um, Jim Leonard's a Big Ten guy. So, you know, unless Carolina leaves the conference tomorrow and goes to the Big Ten, he's not coming here. Um, no thanks to DJ Durkin. Sorry, I don't I don't want a guy that might kill one of my players um, on the coaching staff. You mentioned, you know, Arnett. Yeah, in this day and age, he's getting paid a lot of money to do nothing. It's not a bad life. Chance to recharge the batteries, spend time with the family. Um, so I don't see him coming. So Jeff Collins is maybe option A. Um, and you mentioned good recruiter would be a good natural fit for where you're recruiting right now. Has done it at the SEC level. Would also bring some head coaching experience to that side of the ball as well. Um, kind of what, you know, the same thing Gene Chizik did. So that's not a bad place to start um, and, and go from there. The, the reason why I, I think this job is going to be, you know, less attractive is like if, if Drake May was coming back, you might be able to go get that big, that big name guy. Cause it'd be like, man, I'm, I'm going to have a Heisman level quarterback. It might take me two years to get my defense where I want it, but year one, I don't need that. Well, you don't have that this year. Like, you don't have a Heisman quarterback on the roster. And you don't know Mac Brown's future. And, and so one of those big-name guys, is he going to maybe want to take the job or knows he might only be there one year? Because either A, Mac Brown retires, or B, Mac Brown, you know, you know, gets fired if we go four and eight, five and seven or whatever. So, but they, they, they need to be aggressive. They need to exhaust all opportunities. Mm -hmm. every candidate possible. This doesn't need to be a small search. It doesn't need to be a quick search. Like if it takes a couple of weeks, that's probably a good thing because that means that Matt Brown is doing his due diligence and talking to every candidate possible. Yeah. I mean, look, in terms of the speed of the hire, I, I, I get what you're saying. Take it slow, get it right. Which I think is, is important. The other thing is, though, if you have somebody that you really want, he's interested, don't 
mess around, like go get that person, get them in place because if there is something they're looking for in the transfer portal that they specifically need for their defense, you have to go get it now. You cannot wait. I mean, look, there is a second transfer window. That is usually guys that are getting passed over on depth charts. It's not quite as loaded as the one that you are currently in. So I feel like to a certain extent, you have to be aggressive. To me, I think you want this done probably in a week and a half, two weeks. I think that's probably the area that you're aiming for because you should know your candidates. To be honest with you, just judging off of the phrasing of the release, I would believe that this move was probably determined after the regular season. So you would hope that they have their list. They're saying, okay, these are the guys that we want to talk to. And and look, some of those guys they may have already talked to. The guys that I brought up, um, Arnett, not not currently at Mississippi State. He was fired midseason, so he was available to talk to. Jeff Collins took a year away from coaching, available to talk to. Um, I, I, I think, you know, there's, there could be some other guys. Like one I didn't mention, Tom Allen, another guy who was fired from Indiana. You've had time to potentially talk to him if you were wanting to. Like there are guys out there that you could legitimately talk to now. Um, even DJ Durkin, he was gone. If, if, if you were wanting to talk to him, Durkin is gone from, uh, from Texas A&M. So like all of these guys were available for you to be able to talk to. Um, I would hope that they've kind of done their homework, but at the same time, I mean, yeah, I don't want this to be quite as quick as remember Randy Clements was snap of a finger. They immediately had him. Um, I, I do want, they said it's going to be a national search. Make sure that you are exhausting all options. Don't just rush to hire somebody because I feel like if they rush to hire somebody, it's probably going to be a lackluster hire, more than likely group of five person that's having to make the step up. But to me, the most important element that they have to have here, and I don't know if you agree, I I need younger coaches in this room. Like, cause you got you you got Monacino, who you like a lot. He's got the pedigree. That's fine. You need someone that's as your defensive coordinator that is a younger voice, because this is one of the oldest staffs in college football. And at some point, you've got to get new ideas in this room. I get it. Like you went with the young hire the first time out, but as you mentioned. Jay Bateman went from coaching a defense that would maybe be on the field if the offense was having a good day. So basically, anytime they didn't play a power conference team when he was there, because that was when Army was good, they would maybe see the field about six or seven possessions a game. That was it. He went to an offense or to you know coach a defense that was playing with an offense that wanted the ball 12, 13, 14 times a game. And I just don't think it fit him well. I don't think it was the youth that was the problem there. Then you go with Gene Shizik, a guy that's a veteran, but the game has passed him by. So you need someone, again, to me, that is younger. And if you can find that guy, I think you've got a real chance to have a pretty successful defense. And here's the thing. I don't know what it is to you because, I, I mean, when, when they made the change earlier today and we were talking about it, you definitely were, were more skeptical than me, which is not shocking, um, that they would be able to make the right hire. But to me, like, what is the level of success? Like, again, if they could be middle of the road to slightly above average at this point, I would take it because where they're at right now, these past three years have been a disaster. Yeah, I mean, the top 60 nationally and top half of the ACC. That's all we're asking. Like, you know, um, if you want to maybe compete at a higher level, maybe top four in the ACC, top 40, top 50 nationally, but – 
you know, I think this offense is going to score and put up points week in, week out to where as long as you score 28, you feel good, like as opposed to 38. So um, I'm not as hell bent on it being a younger guy. Like if you find an older coach that's the right guy, then hire him. But make sure he's the right guy that's going to relate to the current players, that's going to have a pulse on the recruiting trail, and understands the way that modern football is being played. That was Gene Chizik's biggest issue, was that in six years, the game changed dramatically. And it was a spread offense, wide open sport six years ago. It's just done completely different now with the RPO. Um, you know, with so much motion and everything, like the game, the game advanced to a higher level, and he didn't advance. And so if you're gonna hire an older coach, he needs to understand that the game's a little bit more complex than it was, you know, five years ago. So um you know, I think I'm skeptical because I know the job isn't very attractive. Like, if we're just being honest, it's it's not an attractive gig. So you might not be able to get the guy that you, you want to get. Um, I mean, you mentioned to pay the money. Carolina paid the money when they brought Matt Brown back. I mean, and they, they put they together really that look at, Like, look at, look at where he ranks in terms of the other coaches. Like – I mean, yeah, I mean me, wait, do you think this guy's going to get paid with, you know, the top of the conference? No. I mean, like, I don't just, see what top of the conference he should be. I mean, outside of Florida State and Clemson, there should be nobody that's paying their de- their, their defensive coordinator more than you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you don't have the money that Virginia Tech has in their football program, Miami. Oh, you've got the money. You just don't um, want to. You don't want to move the assets around. Like, so, that's yeah. what it is. I, I don't I don't think money is going to be the issue, but I mean, if, if, if you're if you're if you're if, if you got to convince a guy because of a, of the amount of zeros on the paycheck, are you hiring the right guy? Like, I don't want a guy that's motivated by money. I want a guy that's motivated by the success that he you know because if you have the success, the money's going to follow. But I don't want to hire him like, buy coaches. You're saying that you don't think anybody's really would really be that interested in that. Really, right? Like, mo- mo- pretty much any legitimate name, nobody should want that job. I, I mean, what is what is the appeal to coming to coach defense at, at UNC? So, my thing would be for sur- for some of the younger guys. So, like Leonard. Although, again, with Leonard, to me, Leonard, I, I like. I don't know how he is not UCLA's defensive coordinator. Like to me, I would tell if I was UCLA, you're in the Big Ten now, so you will be recruiting in the same areas as he's recruiting right now. You literally open up the book, slide it over to him, and say, "How much do you want?" Um, but I mean, look, if they if they're not as interested in him as they as they would think, like how much longer does that guy want to be the special assistant I, I don't which if it's like mac brown's assistants i don't think they're paid so he's an unpaid guy that works on illinois staff like i mean that's not the greatest job in the world either and my pitch to him to maybe zach arnett um because i i, I think to me like the job that he had at mississippi state was impossible trying to follow up Mike Leach after everything that happened. They made an emotional hire after, you know, Leach's passing and you took over. I mean, how many games did he coach after Mike Leach passed away? Was it one? Was it the bowl game? I think it was. So, like, he was in a weird, weird spot right there. So my pitch to those two guys in particular would be, look, this could be your stepping stone to being a head coach. Like, Mac Brown, look, Mac's going to be the one that's going to bring you in here, but that's one where Bubba Cunningham is sitting with them and saying, look, we're bringing you in, and we want to see. If you guys prove yourselves here, if you guys are able to show us enough, then you will be our next head coach. Like, I, I would not hate that at all. So I, I think that might be the pitch that you roll out there. But ultimately, 
Um, I mean, look, I do think that there will be some people also, especially, you know, you're talking about some of the some of the older coaches. I think some of the older coaches could look at it and one, they respect Mac Brown. They'll know who that is and they'll say we respect we respect his prowess. It's just we fe- we feel like we could be the person to go and help. And that's really the other part of it. I there are definitely coaches out there. And we've seen them all over, man. We had one of them on the staff here recently that comes to mind. Tim Brewster is, is like this. He sees a challenge and says, let me attack that. There could be some older defensive co- defensive coaches that say, ah, why not? That's a different type of challenge. Now, ultimately, they may, they may end up leaving after one year, which could be the risk you run. But, I mean, as you said, you don't know when your head coach is stepping away. So, I mean, I, I don't know. The other thing that you have to do, regardless of who the guy is, is if he wants to part ways with other guys on this staff, you have to let him. I get it, man. It's going to be tough. You really love some of the guys. And I and and if you want to make the pitch to the guy of, hey, this is the reason we believe he should stay, fine. Ultimately, if he ends up deciding, I need my own guys in here, you cannot do what you did to Gene Chizik. You have to let a new guy hire his own people because that was a big part as we said earlier, of what did Gene Chizik in. You can, because if you're going to be that stubborn about it, then I'm going to tell you more than likely that could lose you a couple of legitimate candidates and leave you with a guy that is an up-and-comer that, hey, I don't really know that many guys in the field. I know really group of five coaches. That's what makes me afraid that Mac Brown could take that route just so that he can say, hey, you're a group of five coach. Let me give you guys that have coached at the power five level and put them around you. There needs to be flexibility here for Mac Brown. Yep, and I think that's why, you know, this hire as much as anything will probably ultimately determine his second stint. Like you get yes. this right, mm-hmm. you probably stay here another three to four years. You get this wrong, we're speeding up the forced retirement, your exit from 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 being the head coach. And so, um, which I don't want to see. I love Mac Brown. I want him to be my head coach as long as as long as possible. So do what you got to do to get this right, so we can enjoy another three to four years of of fun football uh, in Chapel Hill on Saturdays. Well, we'll see, man. It shouldn't be too long. Uh, Carolina has never really been slow moving on these types of hires. They always usually typically move fast. They know who they want. So we'll see. Hopefully they're aggressive and they go after some guys. As I mentioned, I've got the article that I'm writing up right now. goes a little more in depth on some of those guys that I mentioned. Um, And, you know, throw in, you know, we didn't see a ton of them here during the live show, but I want to hear – you know, some of the guys that that you guys are interested in, because maybe there's a candidate that I haven't seen and I read up a little bit more on and say, you know what, that's that is a really interesting one. I, I want to know who are the really interesting candidates out there that you guys like. So send those to us. We greatly appreciate that. Check that article out. That'll be up for you guys. Uh, we do have a couple of guys playing in the Under Armour All-American game that are Tar Heel signees. Uh, that happened actually earlier today. Team Ice uh, destroyed Team Fire. Don't even get me started on the team names for this. I mean, geez, just, just I mean, black and white, uh, whatever, you know, uh, any whatever jersey color they're wearing. I know they've gone to just some insane jersey colors over the last few years, but like, it, it, the team names are very odd, but I'm going to watch that. Uh, I know Davey and Gauss did score a touchdown in that game. I'm going to watch it a little more in depth and uh, take a look at how those guys performed. And then, of course, Carolina will have four guys that will play in the All-American Bowl uh, on Saturday. So I'll be checking that out as well. We'll have articles up about both of those events uh, and how the Tar Heel guys looked in those outings. And uh, going to try to get on. I know Andrew Ivins, who's a guy we've had on the podcast before, going to try to get him on to talk about uh, what he saw down. I know he was at the Under Armour All-American game. Not sure if he then will shift over and try to get to San Antonio. If he does, uh, we'll try to get him on uh, regardless uh, to talk about some of these uh, guys that Carolina 
has playing in these games and about the recruiting class as a whole. So know that is uh, something I'm working on behind the scenes for you guys uh, as we get into uh, this portion of the offseason. Also, 2025 class starting to roll in. Three guys had Carolina on their top schools list. I tell you all about that. That'll be another article going up here very soon. So that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the podcast. Uh, and we want to uh, thank you guys for watching and listening. And as always, go Tar Heels.